51. The Return to Reality Hadas, in his introduction to the translation of three Greek romances, commented, quote, What the serious reader finds most objectionable in the Greek novels is their shrieking implausibilities. There is no logical nexus between event and event or between event and character. But in a world where the links of causality are broken and fortune has taken control of the affairs of men, it is the very incalculability of events that absorbs interest. Logic is supplanted by paradox and emotion becomes sentimentality to be savoured for its own sake. The cavalier attitude to probability is not a mark of indifference, but a true reflection of current beliefs. Consequently, by making virtue triumph in the end, as they regularly do, our authors are consciously arguing that, appearances to the contrary notwithstanding, there is a divine power which does guide and protect its special charges. If an Ephesian tale is an absorbing tale of love and improbable adventure, it is also a tract to prove that Diana of the Ephesians, who was equated with Isis, cares for her loyal devotees. End quote. Hadass's term, quote, their shrieking implausibilities, end quote, is an excellent one. This is even more true of much of Asia's literature, of pre-Christian European tales, and of the legends and stories of other continents. Moreover, because of the deep influences of Neoplatonism, much of European literature during the quote-unquote Middle Ages is marked by the same, quote, shrieking implausibilities, end quote, it is dominated by an idea, often an idea of love rather than reality. In the world of Hades's three novels, Diana of the Ephesians and other gods and goddesses still ensured a happy ending, but before long the fate of the gods was also to pass away, with fate and fortune toppling all things. Then, as now, another kind of shrieking implausibility developed, a determined view that held that the universe was causeless, perverse, and meaningless. Again, in this view, quote, the links of causality are broken, end quote, and events are as incalculably frustrating and perverse as they were before, incalculably lucky or fortunate. In either case, causality is meaningless. The universe, or multiverse, is not penetrable by reason because it is irrational and meaningless. The results of any action are the products of chance, and for reason to confront utter irrationality is frustration compounded. Men, however, have not been ready to accept the logical conclusion of their worldview. This implicit and explicit denial of all causality and rationality has never been systematically adhered to. When men have no goddess, fortuna, or lady luck to appeal to as a remedy against chaos, then they turn to such answers as occultism, the spirits or powers who, in alliance with man, introduce a new principle of power and rule into the universe. Modern literature, films and television reveal the same, quote, shrieking implausibilities, end quote, because they have a common premise. In the Roman era, Seneca wrote in Hippolytus, quote, The shifting hour flies with doubtful wings, nor does swift fortune keep faith with anyone. End quote. A medieval French proverb held that quote, fortune has no reason. End quote. Similar ideas prevail today. The recurring theme of much literature is simply the perversity and irrationality of life and also the irrationality of the mind itself. Another era will remark on the studied and quote, shrieking implausibilities end quote, of modern writers. One of the dangers of continuous exposure to modern art forms is the influence of their shared philosophy so that the implausible becomes the plausible for us. However much man may reel against the irrationality and perversity of the world, he will still, as a creature created in God's image, seek to comprehend that world by means of a system of thought that is to impose rationality on irrationality as a means of coping with it. However, the regenerate man is delivered not only from sin, but also from this world of, quote, shrieking implausibilities, end quote. His universe is now a realm of causality and meaning, and, like himself, 
It is God's creation. As a result, his growth in grace is a heightened awareness. He becomes progressively more knowledgeable about God, man, law, and the universe. He is living in terms of reality, not imagination. All men, whether they like it or not, live in a real world. However, not all men are ready to live in terms of reality, which supremely means that God is sovereign and that the universe, God's handiwork, moves in terms of his law. Salvation, in part, means conformity to this reality. St. Paul, in Romans 2, 12-16, gives us a sharp perspective on this matter. Quote, For as many as have sinned without law shall also perish without law, and as many as have sinned in the law shall be judged by the law. For not the hearers of the law are just before God, but the doers of the law shall be justified. For when the Gentiles, which have not the law, do by nature the things contained in the law, these, having not the law, are a law unto themselves, which show the work of the law written in their hearts, their conscience also bearing witness, and their thoughts the meanwhile accusing or else excusing one another. In the day when God shall judge the secrets of men by Jesus Christ according to my gospel. End quote. For many people, statements like this one are a problem. How can St. Paul, the champion of salvation by God's grace through the atonement of Jesus Christ, speak of justification by law? Quote, the doers of the law shall be justified. End quote. This sounds very much like James 2, 17-26. Quote, Even so faith, if it hath not works, is dead, being alone. Yea, a man may say, Thou hast faith, and I have works. Show me thy faith without thy works, and I will show thee my faith by my works. Thou believest that there is one God, thou doest well. The devils also believe and tremble. But wilt thou know, O vain man, that faith without works is dead? Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he had offered Isaac his son upon the altar? Seest thou how faith wrought by his works and by works was faith made perfect? And the scripture was fulfilled which saith, Abraham believed God and it was imputed unto him for righteousness and he was called the friend of God. Ye see then how that by works a man is justified and not by faith only. Likewise also was not Rahab the harlot justified by works when she had received the messengers and had sent them out another way? For as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead also. End quote. James says that, quote, by works a man is justified and not by faith only. End quote. St. Paul, however, also tells us in Ephesians 2, 4 and 5, 8 to 9, Quote, but God, who is rich in mercy, for his great love wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us together with Christ. By grace ye are saved, for by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of ourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. End quote. This is emphatic. Salvation is the work of God, and it is entirely of grace. None of these statements, however, are in contradiction. The initiative, determination and ordination in our redemption is entirely of God. But man is not a puppet nor an automaton. His response to God's grace and his manifestation of the grace of God is by faith and faith reveals itself in works. The just live by faith. They place their whole trust in the saving grace of God and they show that trust by their works. A dialectical or a dualistic view of man's nature has long haunted our view of man and as a result the unity of man's actions evades us, even as it escaped St. Paul's Greek audiences. For a biblical psychology, the unity of mind and body and of faith and works is the inescapable fact. As a result, the problem is not one of reality, but of ideas imposed on reality. There is still another aspect to be considered. St. Paul's statement that, quote, the doers of the law shall be justified, end quote. Let us analyse what St. Paul tells us in Romans 2, 12-16. 1 
First of all, the term, quote, without law, end quote, or without the law, means without God's law revealed in Scripture, not without any law whatsoever. Those who are within the law, that is, within the tradition of the biblical faith and the revelation therein of God's law, shall be judged by that law. Second, those who are Gentiles and unbelievers shall also be judged and perish, quote, without law, end quote, or outside the terms of biblical law. The standard of their judgments, as verses 14 and 15 make clear, is still the law of God as written into the nature and constitution of all reality and man. Hodge's comments on the doctrinal import of these verses is of particular interest. Quote, the responsibility of men being very different in this world, their rewards and punishment will, in all probability, be very different in the next. Those who knew not their Lord's will shall be beaten with few stripes, and those who are faithful in the use of ten talents shall be made rulers over ten cities. Verses 9 and 10. The heathen are not to be judged by a revelation of which they never heard, but as they enjoy a revelation of the divine character in the works of creation, chapters 1, 19 and 20, and of the rule of duty in their own hearts, verses 14 and 15, they are inexcusable. They can no more abide the test by which they are to be tried than we can stand the application of the severer rule by which we are to be judged. Both classes, therefore, need a saviour. Verse 12. The moral sense is an original part of our constitution and not the result of education. Verse 14. Jesus Christ, who is to sit in judgment upon the secrets of all men, must be possessed of infinite knowledge and therefore be divine. Verse 16. This failure of the ungodly, and it here means those who never heard or read the Bible, that is, the pagans of antiquity and those of today who are outside of the realm of Christian missions, is a failure judged in terms of the revelation of God's law in them and around them. The millions who have never heard the gospel still have this general revelation, according to Romans 1, 8-21, and they suppress it or, quote, hold, end quote, it down in unrighteousness. Murray feels that, quote, holding down, end quote, is not an accurate rendering of the Greek and offers as the accurate sense, quote, hinder, end quote, or, quote, restrain, end quote, quote, unquote, hold back, so that the truth is restrained or denied. These have the law of God, although not in its scriptured form, and they are judged by the law given to them. Those who have heard the gospel or are inside the pale of special revelation are judged accordingly. As Murray Swabley states it, quote, The judgment of those inside the pale of special revelation who rejected the gospel will be executed in terms of three criteria, all of which were applicable to them. A. The criterion of law naturally revealed, which, of course, applies to all men. B. The criterion of law specially revealed, which did not apply to the preceding class. And C. The criterion of the gospel, which likewise did not apply to the preceding class. They will be judged by the gospel because they rejected it, that is, they will be condemned for gospel unbelief. It is a capital mistake to think, however, that unbelief of the gospel will be the only condemnation of such. It would violate all canons of truth and equity to suppose that the sins against law, naturally revealed, or specially revealed, would be ignored. By faith in the grace of the gospel, sins are blotted out, but other sins are not waived by unbelief of the gospel. Hence, law in the utmost of its demand and rigour will be applied to the judgment of those in this category. They will be judged according to their works. This also is expressly stated in verse 12, quote, As many as have sinned with the law shall be judged through the law, end quote. Judgment according to works, therefore, applies to all who will be damned, end quote. This still does not answer the question as to verse 13, quote, For not the hearers of the law are just before God, but the doers of the law shall be justified, end quote. Negatively, we have already seen that, quote, specially revealed law is not the precondition of sin, quote, as many as have sinned without the law, end quote, because such are sinners, they will perish, end quote. Thus, negatively, the law condemns, 
but Paul also says positively that the law in some sense justifies. How is this to be understood in terms of justification by God's grace? Let us consider again Moses Harris's comment about the, quote, shrieking implausibilities, end quote, of classical Greek novels. Quote, There is no logical nexus between event and event, or between event and character, end quote. In the world outside of Christ, there is no logical nexus between anything, things fall apart, and there is no centre. It is an exercise in patience sometimes to read such literature because the logical nexus is missing. Modern literature tries to find a logical nexus outside of God and it thereby reveals its Christian background as well as its apostasy. The nexus is sought in such things as man and his psychology and in the proletarian revolution. But in these things and other instances, the nexus is artificial and is imposed on events. A university student, an intelligent and practical girl, summed up in disgust her reaction to two courses on ancient epics and sagas. Quote, They are fairy tales. End quote. There was no logical nexus which tied them to reality. This lack of logical nexus is impossible for the Orthodox Christian. All things, having been created by God, have their meaning also from Him. Salvation does not sunder reality, it cleanses and purges it. Faith, knowledge, law, grace and works are not in contradiction to one another, but in harmony under God. Remove the triune God and no nexus remains. Redemption reunites man to God so that God's saving acts means our response of faith and our obedience to the law. Gnostics, Neoplatonists and Manichaeans will separate these things, but the Christian will hold to the primacy of God's determination of all things and its responding harmony in all of man's being. Because God redeems us through Christ's atoning work, we respond with faith and our works are in terms of the law. Supremely and centrally, most essentially, we are justified by the law in the person of Jesus Christ, who kept the law perfectly for us. Quote, For we have not an high priest which cannot be touched with the feelings of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. Hebrews 4.15 We fell by Adam's sin. We are redeemed by Christ's atoning sacrifice in our stead and his perfect law-keeping. In both cases, we are judged in terms of a representative man, the Adam of the old humanity and the Adam of the new humanity. In the old Adam, we sinned. In the new man, Jesus Christ, we keep the law. Our life outside of Christ reflected Adam's declaration of independence from and war against God. Our life in Christ reflects our trust and dependence on him and our obedience to his law word. We do not reflect Christ's perfect obedience in this life, but we are now the people of Christ, the people of the law. We are doers of the law because Christ is the doer of the law and we cannot be his people if we deny him by unbelief and by disobedience. For us, the logical nexus has been restored. We neither wrongly divide the word of God nor do we wrongly divide reality. Ours is not a world of, quote, shrieking implausibilities, end quote, but the glorious handiwork of God.